Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to some more Warhammer lore, or, well, kind of. Today we're going to be looking at Nippon, of all things, because it has been requested quite a few times, but the reason why I hesitate a little bit on the Warhammer lore thing is... If anything, this is more Warhammer Fantasy roleplay lore, e.g. kind of but not quite canon, rather than necessarily true Warhammer. The simple fact is that Nippon was never really fleshed out in any truly meaningful fashion. There were apparently some plans to look into various box sets and army rule books during the 80s and early 90s, but the plans never really amounted to much, and so all that we really know is the occasional mentions in other army books, in the Warhammer Fantasy role-playing books, and some other sources. Uh, so there will be perhaps a bit of conjecture every now and then, so bear that in mind. Right then, Nippon Pon, a wonderful country filled with the Nipponese, uh, slanty-eyed yellow people that are named after Japanese brands. And no, I'm not kidding. Remember, this was during the 80s and 90s, when you could actually make a joke with mild racial undertones without being charged with a crime. And due to that, we have many characters with such wonderfully original names as Toyota, Suzuki, Kawasaki, or Nissan. But hey, how much originality do you really expect? The country is called Nippon, which is literally just the Japanese word for Japan. But hey, details. You don't come to 1st and 2nd edition Warhammer, where this shit was first invented, for originality. That came much, much later. So, Nippon. The first people who got in contact with it that we actually know about would probably be the High Elves. It is unclear exactly for how long they've been trading with Nippon, but they were probably one of the first races to do so as the High Elves had a vast naval empire since long before the War of the Beards. Unfortunately, we're not entirely sure as to when Nippon actually became a proper nation, since of course the humans of the Old World didn't start getting into any kinds of positions of power or nation building until long after the War of the Beards. Oh, and just in case somebody doesn't know, the War of the Beards, or also alternatively known as the War of Vengeance, was a massive near-apocalyptic war between the High Elves and the Dwarves, at the height of their respective power. This gargantuan power struggle eventually formed the Old World as we know today, that used to be settled by the High Elves. They were driven out by the Dwarves, and the Dwarves were far too depleted in numbers to try and occupy it. And it was inside of this power vacuum that the various tribes of men would eventually come to establish themselves, nations such as the Empire and Bretonia. We cannot know precisely when, or why, a similar rise to power happened for the humans in the Far East, but we do have some general indications. For example, about 240 odd years before the Imperial Calendar was started, a certain Dark Elf Shade, Kaldor Maglan, discovered what was known as the Black Way. This is essentially a massive series of underground caves that somehow passes below the Black Spine Mountains and leads all the way to the Boiling Sea on the west coast of the New World. This eventually allowed them to head out into the deeper seas away from the New World, and eventually happened across the easternmost lands. Of course, this was an entirely uncharted area, so the vast majority of expeditions failed miserably, but they did apparently find something, as some expeditions did return with treasure troves of slaves and various items. That, of course, means that they found something worth pillaging, but it does not necessarily mean that they found Nippon. There are several other nations in that general area, and of course they could simply have run into individual tribes, villagers, perhaps some kind of sea monster race, who knows? But at the very least, it does indicate that there was, as mentioned, something worth pillaging, and one of those things could have been Nippon. And indeed, it was even relatively likely, since they would have been one of the closest landmasses to the exits of the Black Way. We also know that there was some form of human civilization to the point of being able to build cities as early as a thousand five hundred years before the Imperial Calendar started up. 
As for organized trade, this has been going on for a very, very long time, probably far before the Imperial calendar was started, but it was only very recently that they actually started to trade with the wider world. Almost all of this trade for all of this time had been conducted via the High Elves, with some trade flowing between the Empire and Cathy via the Silk Road, an extraordinarily dangerous and long road that, amongst other things, leads straight through the Ogre Kingdoms. Not to mention passing dangerously close to Chaos Dwarf Strongholds, Hobgoblin Nests, Goblin Infested Swamps, etc, etc. It's a testament to just how profitable the odd caravan that actually gets through is, that it's still actually going. A considerably safer and more lucrative form of trade was established between Nippon and Marienburg, a independent city-state in the Old World. This was established around about 2475 in the Imperial Calendar, and eventually led to the growth of a large Nipponese community in Nipponstad, a form of foreign ghetto, of which there are many indeed, in Marienburg, and eventually also the establishment of a Nipponese embassy. And this is pretty much the extent to which Nippon interacts with the other major human factions, at least the ones we know of. As for the High Elves, however, considering that they have their very own trading quarter on Ulthuan, of course in the Foreigner District, obviously, but still, they clearly have far tighter ties to the High Elves, but considering they've been trading with them for two, three, four thousand years, that does kind of stand to reason. Now, with all of that being covered, let's actually finally move on to talking about Nippon itself, because I've kind of been putting that off because we don't actually know that much. One thing we do know is that Nippon is ruled by a semi-divine emperor, known as the Divine Son. Considering this is Warhammer Fantasy, he could be a normal human that simply has a fancy title, or he could be a mage with some kind of life-extending magic, or he could be some form of actual magical creature. There is also the off chance that he might be somewhat chaotic in nature. Now, the exact extent to which chaos has an influence in Nippon is unclear. Considering that they have dealings with the High Elves, it clearly isn't their main religion or anything, but it does appear to be perhaps a little bit more out in the open than in, for example, the Empire. This we can assume from a mention of a deity, Tsinsin, which is apparently some form of minor manifestation of Zinch that was worshipped, whilst not you know, completely openly and widespread, was certainly something that far more people knew about and understood. This again doesn't mean that they actually worship Chaos, but they do seem to have a slightly better grasp of precisely what it is than the citizens of, for example, the Empire or Bretonia. I would also reckon that Nippon would be fertile soil indeed for some of the more extreme forms of chaos worship, because it is an extraordinarily tumultuous land. There may be an emperor, and he may be a divine son, but he holds a very little real political or military power. All of that lies in his various retainers, the samurai. No mention of a shogun, by the way, so this is literally all of the various supposedly loyal retainers of the Divine Emperor, all fighting each other for anything and everything they might want. And there are hundreds and thousands of these. Basically, every single local noble who calls himself a samurai has his own little plot of land. Or if he doesn't have that, he at least has a small group of retainers. Or if he has none of that, he would be a landless lord, a hedge knight of sort, but a bit more important. And there are virtually none of these lords that actually have control over vast quantities of other lords. This means that not only does the country have a weak emperor, they have virtually nothing in the way of power structure whatsoever. Just hundreds upon hundreds of warlords, each owning their own tiny little territory, constantly fighting each other. Calling Nippon unstable would be the grossest form of understatement. In fact, referring to it as a unified nation at all seems 
somewhat wrong. All this chaos, all this mischief, all this mutilation, mass murder, constant violence, and general worship of the rule of the strong would make Nippon the perfect grow bed for certain chaotic deities. Corn uh, foremost amongst them. But Zinch also has more than a few snacks lying about, seeing as Nippon is basically in a constant state of upheaval. Think about it like this. In the Empire, you have a relatively rigid social structure. The peasant works for the mayor. The mayor works for the local noble. The local noble swears fealty to his elect account, and the elect account swears fealty to the emperor. And due to the fact that the Empire is a fairly stable society and has been for a very, very long time, there is a very small chance that any of this is going to change drastically. Whilst in Nippon, a peasant might be working for his local mayor one day. Then a travelling samurai comes by and simply takes a bunch of the peasants with him. Then that samurai is defeated in battle by another samurai, who brings the peasants with him. Then he deposes the peasants on his land, now the peasant is working for a new mayor. Then that mayor does something to piss off the samurai and he simply cuts his head off, because they do that quite frequently. Now he's working for a new mayor. Then his samurai master does something to piss off another samurai with a considerably bigger army that comes over, beats the shit out of the samurai, probably chops his head off, and takes all of his snuff. Now the peasant is working for a new mayor, a new samurai, and a new samurai overlord. And for how long that's going to go on, absolutely nobody knows. It could last a year, hell, it could last a decade. Or it could last less than a week. The only real constant is that Nippon is an extraordinarily strictly class-based society. The peasants work the fields and provide their samurai overlords with troops and food. In return, the samurai offer the peasants their protection. Although precisely what protecting the peasants really means is very much so up to the individual samurai's interpretation. If he, for example, interprets that the best way of protecting his peasants would be to raise them all into an army and invade his neighbours, then as far as he's concerned, that's fulfilling his part of the deal just fine. Another class is that of various religious orders, although whilst technically religious in nature, that does not necessarily mean that they preoccupy themselves primarily with religious matters. There are military orders, there are scholarly orders, and there are of course orders based primarily around theology. They select their members from a very young age, and then have them study their chosen field pretty much their entire lives. This, as you can probably imagine, produce some absolutely remarkable scholars. But it also means that these various religious orders are 100% reliant upon the other classes to provide them with food and, in many cases, protection. The interesting thing here is that Nippon society seems to be a highly symbiotic society. The various religious orders provide training. In philosophy, in martial arts, in technology, the samurai provide protection and the peasants provide the foodstuff. At its base, this is a fairly symbiotic society. The lower classes produce food, the warrior classes provide protection, and the intellectual classes provide understanding, knowledge, and research. The only problem is that Nippon is an extraordinarily fractious society. So whilst a somewhat similar setup is available in the Empire, and that has led to some absolutely remarkable advancements in science, in technology, and in society, in Nippon, some of these advancements have happened, like for example, they do have access to gunpowder, but the simple fact is that in a society where day-to-day -day life can change so drastically, so quickly, and on such a regular basis, it is extraordinarily difficult to actually get any long-term benefits out of these symbiotic relationships, because the moment you remove one piece of this symbiotic relationship, the whole thing totters and falls down. If the peasants, for example, are dragged away by some roaming samurai lord, then the scholars simply starve to death. If the scholars aren't around, then there is no technological advancement or philosophical advancement in the area, and it all stagnates. Without the samurai, the area will be open to pillage and plunder from other factions that have a warrior caste. So on and so on and so on.
But the benefits of such a ridiculously fractious society is of course that the dudes doing the fighting, that being the samurai, have gotten really, really good at it. To the point that the other surrounding major powers are actually quite afraid of Nippon, despite the fact that the Nipponese can't really bring to bear any kind of massive organised army, they can bring to bear very individual and extraordinarily skilled fighters, and for some interesting reason, they're also apparently a notable sea power, which is interesting because the Japanese, upon which the Nipponese are of course based, well, they weren't much of a seagoing power. Pretty much ever. Let's just say that the way in which they design ocean going vessels leaves a lot to be desired. But hey, details. They are at least a relatively powerful land force with some rather interesting and diverse armies. Obviously, they are led by the samurai. The samurais themselves have various ranks within them, which basically just describes how much power, wealth, and land one of them possesses. So there isn't technically any noble difference between a samurai and a samurai lord, but the lord in all your likelihood is going to have access to a hell of a lot more land, taxes, troops, and therefore also better equipment and armor than a roaming samurai. These lords may also have their own personal retinues of other samurai disciples. These will be his pupils, his retainers, his family members, stuff like that, and they will be fanatically loyal to their lord. Because in Nipponese society, failure is not tolerated. Thusly, they understand full well that if their lord were to fall, they would fall alongside him. There may also be some additional formations of samurai within the army, roaming lordless individuals, peoples just looking for plunder, riches, fame, any of all the usual things that motivate angry Japanese men with swords. The vast majority of the army, however, are going to be made up of good old fashioned peasantry. Now, the peasants are not particularly motivated to fight for their lords, considering they are the ones who are supposed to be protecting them. But as always, it is truly remarkable how persuasive a sharp edge can be when placed upon the soft, squishy bits of a peasant's underbelly. When formed into units, they are referred to as Ashigaru, and generally speaking are handed either a spear, a longbow, or on rare occasions an arquebus. Usually the spear, because spears are easy and cheap to mass produce, and they don't require that much in the way of training. You have a pointy end. Stick the pointy end into the bad guy. These are not the disciplined spear blocks of Empire State troops, but they are at least a tad bit better than the completely and utterly unorganized and untrained peasant formations of Bretonia. They also do make half decent archers, as they are usually equipped with a form of a longbow, which is relatively effective. As for the arquebuses, whilst they are obviously very, very effective weapons, they are also quite complicated, time consuming, and difficult to acquire. Considering the specialized information, technology, and skill required to produce them, they would, in all due likelihood, only be produced by a handful of monk orders. These orders would in turn essentially become, in all due likelihood, strategic objectives for the various warlords, because if they can acquire the services of one of these orders, they can equip their men with arquebuses, which are of course very useful. It's also quite likely that other orders might have the secret to producing gunpowder, which can produce all kinds of wonderful weapons, arquebuses of course being one amongst them, and also kamikazes. These are individuals who have volunteered to die in this particular battle by strapping large quantities of black powder to their bodies, running into the middle of enemy formations, and detonating said bags of black powder. Not the most humane tactic in human history granted, but you cannot argue with its effectiveness. If you can sacrifice one dude and a few bags of gunpowder to kill 30, well that's a pretty damn good trade. Incidentally, if at the end of the battle the kamikaze has not found anybody to blow himself up on, he will simply just kill himself, because he is of the opinion that, having failed to do his duty in battle, there really is no reason for him to stay living. It is an interesting choice of name though. Kamikaze refers to a divine wind who once saved Japan from a Mongol invasion, and is made up of the two words kami, meaning god, and kaze, meaning wind. Ergo, Kamikaze 
Divine Wind. It was used during the Second World War by the Japanese, where they had people volunteer to jump into their aircrafts and ram them into American ships. Again, not the most humane of tactics, but you certainly couldn't question the effectiveness of it. There are also ninjas, by the way. Because of course there's ninjas. They can infiltrate formations of Ashigaru and other infantry units and then spring out once in combat with the enemies, viciously butchering enemy individuals of considerable import. There are presumably also a few different versions of samurais, you know, mounted samurai, bow samurai, ar arquebus samurai, etc. There may also be formations that specialize in using particular weapons, like the Nodachi, a gigantic two-handed katana. But we don't have all that much in the way of information about them, nor do we know much about how they wage war. We do know that ninjas will hide within formations of regular troops, so they must have some form of basic formation tactics. We also know that the samurai will make sure that they stay a certain distance away from the rest of the plebeians for obvious reasons. We also know that the samurai are very, very preoccupied about their own individual skill at arms. Which probably means that formations of samurai will run screaming towards the enemy as quickly as they can to make sure that everybody sees just how big of a dick they have. Presumably, they would also be very, very interested in seeking out enemy formations of some repute. The samurais, in all your likelihood, would consider being sent up against peasants to be somewhat insulting. They're samurai, they're nobles, why should they fight these filthy peasant fucks? That's, that's not what they're there for. They are there to win glory, to win honor and repute by fighting noble and honorable foes, not... Healthy peasant scum. We can also assume that they are probably very, very fond of decapitating their defeated enemies, because that was another thing the Japanese were extraordinarily fond of. But in all your reality, we don't have that much in the way of information, and honestly, I've already made more out of the available information than I have any real right to do, so... With that, I'll wrap up the video on Nippon. I hope it was somewhat enjoyable, despite the somewhat loose nature of the information. So, until next time, I have been Arch, thank you all very much so for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.